And so this is the job, you know, um, uh, we have a good friend. His name is Joel Weldon. Joel, Joel says, you know, salespeople don't get paid for the yeses. The yeses are the easy part. They get paid to hear the word no. Get paid to hear the word no. If you just hear the word yes, and that's all you ever hear, then you are an order taker. That is what you are. You are an order taker. If you're a salesperson, then you are going to hear the word no a lot. Welcome to the Waste No Day podcast, a podcast specifically for and about the home services industry as it relates to plumbing, heating, air conditioning, and electrical. More than a podcast, Waste No Day is a credo, a determination, a mindset. It is a never-ending discipline. It is a refuse-to-lose pursuit. It is a wake-up call every morning to waste no day. Now here's your hosts, Brian Burton and Nate Minnick. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Waste No Day podcast. Your host, Nate and Brian, are hanging out with you, and we're dropping a new and exciting episode, this time focusing on the book, Go For No. Yeah, let's underline that no part in the Waste No Day podcast. Ah, I see what you episode. did there. Nice job. The phenomenal, phenomenal book, Go For No. Um, uh, I have listened to it three times since uh, our buddy Tommy Mello recommended it. And like everything Tommy Mello has recommended, and I'm not saying this to, to butter dude up, I'm just t- stating a fact here, we have found uh, success with in some form or another. It's good stuff. We really have. We just got on the rapid fire. fire? Uh, no, that's a, that's a different project. <laughs> the rapid fire pro project, it's yeah. different. So. We're working on that one. We'll, we'll terminate uh, unwanted employees for you. without Rapidly. You know, nobody's feelings get hurt. You know, <laughs> take all the anxiety out of it for the boss. Yeah, that's going to be our yeah. custom uh, program here at the Waste No Day podcast, the rapid fire program. So the rapid hire pro that Tommy was talking about on his episode with us, um, we've actually signed up with and we're moving forward with, and it looks like it looks fairly revolutionary, to be perfectly honest, wouldn't you say, Mr. Marketing? Uh, yeah, from a base level. And stay tuned on the results, of course, but uh, from what they showed me, yeah, I was impressed. You know we're going to talk all about those results on here, so we're going to need to see some briefcases full of cash come our way if uh, <laughs> this doesn't work out. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Our guests today are going to be Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz. They are the authors of this book, and it is a short and quick read. And Brian, I know you found it to be particularly uh, engaging. Yeah, so it's in it's like story format. It's like a fiction novel, uh, kind of like it's a it's just a I don't know, was this an hour and a half long story of somebody who wakes up one morning and here we go, and I just. I'll talk about this with the authors, but I, I had a long drive ahead of me like a couple of days after Tommy was on and um, taking my son to a wrestling tournament. That was like, I think like two hours away. So I listened to it on the way there, liked it so much, listened to it again on the way home and then listened to it again a couple of days later. Um, because the first time it was kind of like getting to know you, you know, where you're watching like a, a new series or a new movie and you don't really know any of the characters. So you're kind of, you know, you, you want to be in, you're not so much. But then when we got to the meat of the book, which obviously doesn't take long in an hour and a half book, I was like, whoa, I got I to gotta back this thing up and start over. And then I liked it so much the second time. I wanted to, I just wanted to do it a third time and then talked about it in a morning training I did um, shortly thereafter. And right, I don't know, next couple of days, I just started trying to get a hold of the authors and saying like, we really, we really want to have you guys on to chop this up. Well, let me tell you, capturing Brian's attention for anything longer than about 15 seconds is quite an accomplishment. So to do a full hour and a quarter, that, all right. good one, good one, that was the wrong sound effect. You wanted the, <laughs> the humorous applause of, of uh, rousing people and fans. You mean that one? Yeah, good one. Uh, somebody got to take Brian away from the uh, control board. But um, it, it, it really, I, I think it impacted you, Brian, and I know I'm excited to talk to these authors and to hear from them because uh, this is good stuff. Uh, but I just realized we have jumped ahead of ourselves. Normally we have a quote, so we need to 
fall back to protocol here, Brian. Let's hear about our quote. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but no can never hurt me. Richard Fenton, go for no. Uh, Using a quote from the author. Well done. You know what I'm saying, bro? (laughs) Well done. Yeah, this was uh, was a couple weeks ago I used a quote from this book to start the podcast. Um. The book is it, the book is so good. It's better than like some little one liners. So don't don't get it twisted and think that it's a book full of little uh, one liners like that. Although that's a significant one liner. If you can walk up the doorway to your next call thinking sticks and stones may break my bones, but no will never hurt me, and I'm going for five on this one or what have you. You're you know you're almost bulletproof. The biggest thing that can stop you is is a fear of the word no. That's the biggest hurdle we have to overcome in the home as salespeople of any kind in any profession. The, As uh, David Sandler would say, keep your kid in the car. I always looked at that as if I'm trying to get my emotional needs met by having them like me to the point that I am afraid to ask them a question that they could answer no and reject me. I'm doing them a huge disservice, and that is my inner kid speaking. And I need to leave him in the truck, and I need to walk in as an adult and understand that I am there to help them make the best decisions possible for their HVAC, plumbing, and electrical systems. And that's what I'm there for. Or now that we know we have uh, audience members who are not even in the trades or in uh, tree services and pool cleaning and all kinds of stuff, but whatever it is, these in-home services or whatever you do, the object as a salesperson, your objective is to take take care of the client in the best way you can. And if you have products and services that can greatly benefit them, it is to present those products and services and it is to ask them to buy them. Dare you possibly risk Hearing the word no. No. <laughs> I'm so used to hearing it from you, Nate, that it's really <laughs> it doesn't it's mean nothing anything. to me. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a nothing burger, buddy. Uh, Brian, the book has a very uh, retrospective feel to it as uh, the main character looks back. And, of course, that is um, just a little bit of a teaser about what we're going to jump into. But for right now, we are excited to put into your passenger seat Richard Fenton, and Andrea Waltz. Our guests today are, we have multiple, Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz. They are the authors of the book Go For No, and they are self-described as the courage crafters. As professional speakers, trainers, and authors, they also call themselves the failure philosophers and the rejectologists. I'm not sure you're going to find that one in the dictionary. Uh, They are the experts on achieving courageous breakthrough through performance of increasing failure rates and other unconventional approaches. With that, we are excited to welcome you both to the show, Richard and Andrea. Thanks, guys. Yeah, great to be here. Great to talk to you, too. I listened to that audio book, actually downloaded on Audible. So we had Tommy on, what was that, two weeks ago? Tommy Mello, uh, yeah. I guess as this airs three weeks, I don't know. I'm not doing all that. All right. <laughs> Look, edit this in later and make me sound like I know how to do basic math. <laughs> no problem. Um, we had Tommy on a few weeks ago, and Tommy, uh, kind of out of nowhere, was was just like a, a really cool book that you should read uh, on on what we're talking about is Go for No. And I'm like, okay, and I just jot it down real quick. And later on, I looked it up on Audible, and it was like an hour. What is it, an hour forty? Yeah, it's pretty short in the big scheme of things. Yeah, so I'm like, oh, there's a, you know, I'm a, I'm a uh, plumber by trade, didn't graduate from high school. Yeah, that's like um, three showers and a lawn mowing for Brian. Right oh there. my gosh, I was so excited to see that I was going <laughs> to knock out an actual book in the time it took to drive my son to to a wrestling tournament, which was two <laughs> hours away, and got through that book. And even my 13 year old at the time, 13 year old son, was like, that was really cool. And I ended up listening to it three times over the course of that week. Um, and we'll get into why and how it was so powerful and impactful for me. Um, but I just want to say, wow, congratulations, one, on such an awesome, powerful piece of um, 
literature for one and two. I'm still shocked that we actually got you guys to come on here and um, very excited myself and a lot of our listeners and people who work with us here are very excited that we have you on because the book has meant a lot to a lot of people here just in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Um, we intentionally kept the book short, uh, which is 80 pages, and that translates to a bit longer when you do it on audio. But the whole idea was to make sure that people would say, hey, I've got time to listen to this now and not put it off. Because you know how many times you, you buy a book that's 300 pages and you promise yourself you're going to start it. And three years later, you know, it's still sitting on the shelf. Um, every time for with, me. Uh, that's every time. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so we said, let's make a book that's short enough that people can read. Executives can read on, a, on an airplane flight and that people can listen in their car in a relatively short period of time around the treadmill. So I'm glad it worked. Yeah, for our purposes, uh, most of our audience is HVAC, plumbing, and electrical technicians, and their average drive time throughout one day might even be able to do the whole book in a day, if certainly not uh, within a week, easily. Uh, so what we want to jump into today is kind of tailoring the conversation to our listening audience, which again, as I mentioned, is predominantly uh, these in-home service professionals, people who are dealing with retail oriented consumers who are having a problem in their home uh, could be plumbing, uh, HVAC, heating and cooling or electrically related. And uh, these are the types of people that, you know, they need to actually interface not only with the technical skills of what it takes to turn the wrench and, uh, you know, tweak the pliers, but also uh, the communication side, which is dealing with a homeowner in distress and so you have all the emotions that are going on with that particular side of things. And then you all have the, the technical, you know, very logical, very uh, left brain side of things that's dealing with the why is there water coming from this pipe scenario. So we feel like uh, the people in the trades are, are some of the best people in the country because they're able to balance both the emotional and the logical side of what goes on in a home and come out on the other end of it. Uh, feeling successful, taking care of the client, and of course, ideally making some money along the way. So that's what makes your book uh, particularly interesting because um, we are always looking to get better. And Brian uh, felt that this would be a great podcast to introduce our listeners to in terms of making that step. One of the things that we um, that we have discovered over the years is that, and and while you know the the tailoring of the content to your specific group and needs. Um, you know, is, is something that we do every time we get on a call. Um, it's also very interesting because this is a very universal concept. Um, you know, this is going to be as equally effective for um, your listeners as it is when we work with a retailer who's selling sweaters and a computer store who's selling, you know, um, computers. And it's really going to get so much of this problem, the emotional part you mentioned, is going on in your head. And it doesn't necessarily matter what it is that you're selling. Um, it starts It starts with what your emotional reaction is to the word no. Absolutely. And I would imagine there's a, a wide variety of um, reactions to that word and, and the feelings that come with it. Before we jump into the actual book, though, and the concept, I want to learn a little bit more about you two. So uh, was this a concept that the two of you had been kind of evaluating through your entire life and it finally came to a climax when you decided, Hey, let's put this on paper or, or was this like one of those epiphany moments where you're like, ah, that's what it is. Let's, let's jot this thing down. And it came fast and furious. What was it for you guys? So there's a story in the book that uh, we tell, which is kind of the signature story. And the main character in the book is selling suits for a living. And he learns from the district manager, a guy named Harold, um, not to stop <laughs> when the customer uh, you know, says no. And um, he learns, he learns to go for no secret. And that is a story that actually happened to Richard. We really? were working. Yeah, we were working at Lens Crafters together. We met on the job. Um, Richard was one of the best trainers in the company. I was uh, new to the training department and I was running a $3 million location. And we got to talking one day and I loved talking with him because um, I would always try to ask him questions to, to trick him into screwing up. <laughs> I was always <laughs> trying to like ask him sales questions and because he always seemed to have his philosophies and his strategies down. He always seemed so smart. So I was always 
peppering him with questions. So we're standing there one day in, in the store and he tells me that go for no story that um, is in the book about him selling suits for a living and learning the go for no story. And I, you guys, I actually thought I was a pretty good salesperson and I had this total epiphany. I was like, oh my God, I don't like to hear the word no. I avoid it. I think I'm a, a good salesperson, but I'm actually, I actually really avoid hearing the word no. So when I learned this concept from Richard, who had had that epiphany like a decade earlier, I just became completely um, hell bent on applying it on the job at our company. And I did, and I, and I worked it and worked it and, and I got great results. And one day Richard comes to me and he's like, Hey, did you know that if we leave our corporate jobs here, that companies will pay us to speak on this concept, to train on this concept? And, and we had talked about all of our other philosophies on sales and customer service and all of that kind of stuff. And we just completely clicked on everything. And he's like, you know, we should quit our jobs and launch our own speaking and training company. And I believed in him so much. And I also was completely naive and had no idea what I was doing. I said, yes, absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> so we, so we ended up, this is about like 22 years ago. Now we quit our job, we launched our company, and then we had to go for no with our own business because we had no clients, we had no track record. We literally were cold, picking up the phone, cold calling like Fortune 500, Fortune 1000 retailers, asking them to bring us in so we could do workshops and go for no was a big part of that. But we also talked about a lot of other stuff. But even so, go for no was the thing that resonated with people more than anything. And eventually we kind of retooled the business after a few years and just literally became the go for no people. Like it is, all we talk about is how do you reprogram your fear of failure, your fear of rejection, and start thinking about no differently. But it all started with Richard on the sales floor at the store that I worked at telling me to go for no story. Yeah, and in regards to your question about, um, you know, how did it how did it go from a uh, mind to paper? Uh, I had told that story, the, the key story from the go for no book. So many times in every job I had had over the course of, um, you know, a 10 year period. And every time I told it to people, it changed their attitudes about hearing the word no. And it literally increased their results. I mean, it showed up in units sold and dollars um, accumulated. And, uh, you know, I, I said, this is really, this is something that absolutely has to be communicated. And so the interesting thing is when we sat down to write the book, and some people talk about, it took me two years to write my book. Well, I wrote that book in 17 days. Yeah. Oh, come and on. Was, <laughs> no, come I, on. I, I did. I did. But, but, but remember, I told the story for a decade. Um, I'd been working it out in my head. I knew, I knew the things that were connected to it. And I was a training director at the company. So I was up in front of people, you know, telling this in a, we'll call it a logical formatted way. So when it came time to write the book, it just, as you said, it poured out. It just poured out onto the paper. That's awesome. So was was that, when you say the story, you're talking about the department store story, not the like back to the future. Uh, awesome. I don't want to give away too much, but. <laughs> right, right. So, so for the listeners, um, let's back up just for a second and, and explain exactly what you just meant there. So the book is a fable and it's about a guy who wakes up one morning he goes to bed he's an average salesman he wakes up one morning and he's in this amazing beautiful house and he doesn't understand what he's doing there because the night before he was in his own house he starts walking around this house and he discovers quite miraculously and yes this is a little bit of a supernatural book supernatural tale if you will he realizes that he is in this gorgeous house that owned that is owned by a future version of himself. He has somehow traveled 10 years in the future to be in this amazing house owned by the future version of him. And he actually ends up meeting himself, this 10 year successful version. And they have to together, they kind of pair up and they have a bunch of conversations and they're trying to figure out, you know, what was it that made this 10 year future him so successful and what it was, was a situation that had happened where um, the, the, the guy, um, our main character, Eric, was selling suits for a living. The district manager, Harold, watched him have this great sale. 
and then came up to him after the sale and said, hey, out of curiosity, what did that customer say no to? And Eric had to admit that that customer didn't say no to every, to anything. Everything he laid in front of that man, that man purchased. And then the district manager said to him, well, then how did you know he was done? And that was uh, an epiphany because our main character had to admit that he didn't know this guy was done. He just, the guy had hit his mental spending limit. He had this mental block. And um, the district manager told him, you know, I watched you sell. You're not half bad, but your fear of the word no is going to kill you. I, if you could just learn to get over that, I think you could be one of the great ones. So this is the story that actually happened to Richard all those years earlier. We put it in the book, and that's what our main character realizes was kind of the fork in the road. And the very successful version of him realizes that he doesn't know what, if he has what it takes uh, to succeed necessarily but he knows he can fail more. He knows that the secret really is just to hear no more often. And if he can do that, always in the customer's best interest, though, and that's mm -hmm. a really important thing. If this is not about badgering or manipulating people or selling them services that they don't need, but in the in their best interest, that going for no is the secret. And so, so when you, you bring up that supernatural story, it's a real story that happened to Richard, but we layer in this um supernatural fable if you will dream a dream is uh probably what it seemed more like uh apart from the very yeah, end right. which i won't get into but well, well, I, right. I feel like christopher nolan's gonna have to uh lay this timeline out for me there that's a, <laughs> yeah. that's a lot of back and forth going on <laughs> that's a cross between like memento and inception yeah right, exactly um yeah you couldn't see and unfortunately we don't do a video podcast as most of our audience drives around all day and we don't want to tempt anyone especially the ones who work for us to uh, sneak a peek at their phone to to see the uh, video that's happening and you know risk wrecking their trucks or anything but when you said um the manager asked him, what did he say no to? I pulled my mic off its stand and pretended to do a mic drop <laughs> for Nate. So, uh, <laughs> and the reason is we, we uh, somewhat cater this podcast to men and women who are currently in service trucks. And a large majority of them don't get to, as you guys know, I'm sure, start, start working until they've sold a job, so to speak. Um, and a lot of times we'll, and I was talking to some some of our team that I was training recently about this book and really pushing uh, the fact that they need to, to get copies of this book. And um, before I realized we were going to have you guys on the show, but I was talking about, we all know very well that client we get to their home and it seems like everything we offer um, they're, they're game for, especially for the third or fourth technician who's been out over the years and recommended the exact same thing. Like you need uh, a water softener for this amount of hardness in your home. And uh, it's a family of seven and you have a 40 gallon water heater and you run out of hot water after two showers. We, we need to put a tankless in here, let's say. And they just say, yes, like everything we offer. And I was thinking or talking to them and I said, how many times have you actually offered things that would be good for them until the point that they said, no, stop, that's enough. Or do we just offer that one package and they say yes, and we're really excited, and they got it done, and they're really happy, and we're high-fiving. But how many times in that situation do we actually go for the no? And I was thinking back to my own career in a truck, and I'm like, I can't even remember doing it. <laughs> how much did I leave for, you know, my buddy, the next tech who went out and and got the other thing later or the rest of that stuff later? Or how many things did I not present that even worse uh, they had a, a friend tell them about and had another company put it in. So they got all the benefits of the product, but we lost a customer as a result of me not going all the way um, with, with the go for no concept. Um, and it was really a sticking point for me. That's that department store story. Like I'm guessing most of the people who are big fans of the book, um, it really, really resonated with me and made me think how many other aspects of life am I you know, quick to accept a yes. I mean, I, I love the concept of, of using no to get to the yes, but even more so, I, I just never heard or thought of the concept of accepting too soft a yes or accepting um, a yes on the way to a, a bigger yes as a result of going for no instead of just going for that first yes. It's almost like a stumbling block. 
Right. Well, you know, the, the, the big issue for most salespeople, um, everybody says, you know, selling is so hard. Actually, selling isn't that hard. Getting over your emotional stigma that you're a, quote, salesperson for a lot of people is what's hard. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a very simple attitude that to sell is to serve. Sales is not something you do to somebody. It's something you do for them. And if you've got a product or a service that will make the other person's life better, then you need to offer it. If your product or service doesn't make their life better, then you got to say, hey, I don't have anything for you today. And if you can get to the point where you walk into each interaction saying, I'm going to do what's best for the customer. Okay, not what's best for me, not what's best for the organization, what's best for the customer. And if my products or services make their life better, I'm going to offer them and keep offering them if they have more things they can offer and keep offering them until they've offered everything there's offered as long as it's in the customer's best interest. But most people think that, you know, they have a fear of being that pushy, aggressive, salesy, you know, salesperson. And I think sometimes people think that that's what go for no means. But actually, it's, as we're trying to describe here, it is the total opposite. It's really about um, having the courage to ask your customers to buy when it's in their best interest and be willing to face the no. Oftentimes, people... They get that first yes and they go like, okay, that's it. I'm going to be done now because I don't want to be pushy and maybe I'll upset somebody and maybe they'll get, you know, they'll get mad or they'll, they'll call corporate or, or they'll cancel this whole deal. And, um, you know, not to get in deep into the nuances of sales training here, but um, you, you guys talked about, you know, you have the mindset, but you also have the technical skill. So in that moment, it's just about saying, hey, I want to show you something. I want to explain something to you. Here's what I see. And so I'm going to recommend something to you based on what I see happening here. And I recommend that this is something that you install or this is something that you get. Um, and here's why. And, you know, that's just your basic go for no strategy. But it's understanding of your intention is to educate. Um, and that's your obligation as a service professional. And then you go for no and you let them decide rather than saying no for them. Okay. So let's role play this out for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, our listeners here a little bit. So let's say that I was shopping for some clothes and, uh, I walk into the store thinking like, uh, I need some new jeans <clears throat> and the, uh, the representative of the clothing store is like, Oh cool. Yeah. You need some jeans. Yeah. Here's some jeans. And I'm like, cool. I'll take one of those. And the person's like, oh, have you considered maybe some new shoes to go with the jeans? I'm like, well, no. And so we go down that line. Oh, some new shoes. Cool. Well, what about a, a nice shirt? And so, you know, a half hour later, I have 65 uh, articles of clothing in 10 bags and a very high credit card bill. Like, how do we translate that, which feels to me like, wow, that guy just walked in there looking to spend $20 and spent $2,000. How do we translate that into your concept here? Um, well, well, generally speaking, I think that um, I'm not trying to uh, make fun of the question because it's a great question. But when people keep saying yes, and you don't feel that there's any pushback or any discomfort, and they just keep saying yes to what you're showing them, um, you should never feel that you're somehow manipulating them even if they did intend to come in and, and spend, you know, twenty dollars or fifty dollars on a pair of jeans, and they, they walked out spending two thousand, two thousand dollars. You know, Harold, the district manager who you know um, taught me this concept originally. Um, you know, one day I walked up to him and I said, "Hey, did you see that I got, you know, I got shirts and ties on that one?" And he says, "You know," he goes, "Richard, I know you, you're very impressed with yourself when you sell a suit, and then you also sh sell the customer a shirt and a tie." He goes, I'll tell you when I'll be impressed with you. I'll be impressed with you when the customer comes in for a shirt and a tie and you sell them the suit. And mm. that was a real gut punch for me because I realized I was always selling down. I was always right. like, if they bought a big thing, I could then sell them some smaller things that went with it. It never crossed my mind that if they came in to look for a small thing, if they were starting with something small, that I could still ask questions of this customer and that I could show them other things, you know, in the store. We, we call this concept selling up, down, across, and sideways. You know, oh, right. it's selling up. It's like it's, they come in looking, they, they come in, look, in my case, come in looking for a suit. 
I don't want to spend more than three hundred dollars. Okay, well, you know, if that's fine. They don't want to spend more than three hundred dollars, but if the suit they need that's going to do what they wanted to do for them on the job um, costs five hundred dollars, it's my responsibility to make sure they see the more expensive suit. Um, you know, it, it may be that there's other things that that same manufacturer makes, and so it's like across. You know, it's like okay, so what are the other things that are connected to this? Sometimes it's down. Sometimes it's they come in looking for something and they got a big budget and I go like, no, you don't need to spend that much. And the minute that you start thinking up, down, across, and sideways, and you you know you stop thinking about am I being manipulative? You just start looking and offering options. Then you're truly you know you're truly doing what's in the customer's best interest. To sometimes sell something that's less expensive because it's the right thing for the customer is the best thing you can do for your own personal self-esteem and psyche because it tells you I always walk into every situation doing what's in the customer's best interest and then it becomes a lot easier to make recommendations. I like that Richard and I have to confess so when I go to the grocery store I feel like I sell myself up just organically you know I walk in there for a dozen eggs and I walk out with like 16 other things uh, and then my wife beats me up at home because you know (laughs) we didn't need three three bags of chips I'm like but they were on sale you know right you got to eat. Um, right. So how, how does the grocery store, like, you know, where that happens and I'm basically upselling myself, how, how do we learn that skill in conversational form? Because in the trades, you know, we don't have a grocery store. Like we don't, we don't have a retail location. We don't have um, even our trucks, uh, which, you know, are probably a mess unless you work for our company in which they're perfectly in order. Right guys. Uh, our trucks, you know, they, they probably aren't exactly a showroom. So when we walk into somebody else's house, we're literally in their house. I mean, there's no opportunity for us to um, show and tell uh, with with like a product display or, or something like that that you would have at a retail location. So how do we get that whole concept of upselling or, or selling up, as you said, uh, into communication form when we don't have the full catalog with us? Right. Nothing is more powerful for service professionals in your industry more than telling stories. Stories are what sell. And so, and and obviously, the more experience and the longer you've been doing this, the more stories you're going to have to be able to tell people. So I think it is a combination of one, being curious, starting off with curiosity and not just throwing things and making recommendations at people without first asking questions. So you have to get curious. How many showers are you guys taking? How many family members do you have? Do you have people, you know, you know, asking as many questions as you can to gather as much information as you can, and then to share experiences, which is, hey, you know what? I had a household very similar to this, and this is what they did. I think that's probably the most powerful way that you can demonstrate how a product can change somebody's life. And if they hear that story, that will usually um, sell them without having to do too much more. Right. And you know, this whole idea when you said the grocery store, how you go in, you know, for, for, you know, one thing and you you walk out with, with 15, um, you're seeing these things around. So I think that's your point. You walk in and they're all there. They're on display. Right. In a situation where, where you, the things are not on display, you have to put them on display in the person's mind by creating these word pictures. You know, so the little things like imagine after we get this blank installed, walking into your house and having blank happen or feeling blank. You know, when you start filling in those blanks for people, when you when you give someone a word picture, they cannot help but to create the picture in their head. You know, um, we, we think in pictures. You know, if I say the word clown, you don't go C-L-O-W-N you get a picture of a clown. Now, I don't know what kind of clown you're picturing. I don't know if it's the happy clown or if it's the one from Stephen King's If I don't know which <laughs> clown you've got here. Right, right. <laughs> but, but you get a picture. And so it's the salesperson's job to clown. always be creating pictures. Clown is never good. Clown, yeah. clown is never good. <laughs> okay, horse. Horse is better. Yeah, okay. So uh, I, I like where you're going there. And I have to ask the question, what about the transition, right? So a lot of the time, in fact, I would say most of the time that our, our professionals are in the home, it's because there's a specific need that is allegedly unrelated to other products. And I say allegedly because it's not always the case. And there's probably a lot of tie-ins, but 
let's take for example, um, well, it's it's winter in uh, in our state here in Pennsylvania, and it's cold. <clears throat> you know, over the past weekend we had twenty degrees of a high with winds of forty miles an hour, real feel of one one degree outside, and it was pretty rough. And um, you know, we had a lot of no heat calls where our service technicians are going out to a house, and there is obviously a problem. the The furnace has broken. There's a part that's failed, et cetera, et cetera. And our selling up would be somehow transitioning that conversation into probably indoor air quality. All right. Um, you know, let's talk about filtration. Let's talk about ultraviolet lights to help uh, kill viruses, bacteria, um, and those types of things in your home, plus make your unit run more efficiently. Or maybe it's plumbing where we're dealing with uh, a leaking pipe and we want to talk about how we're getting into water treatment. I think sometimes, you know, that's where we struggle in terms of how do we make that transition, which it can feel like a massive chasm. You know, we're trying to jump from one end of the canyon to the other and there's no bridge in between. So how do we make that jump? And we, we don't just be like, okay, so now that I fixed your pipe, let's talk about other stuff that I can talk to you about. Yeah, I think we have to start really you guys with just a mindset of seeing yourself as a consultant or as an advisor and think about how you would handle this exact situation if this was a family member i mean if this was like your mom you'd be like okay mom like okay we fixed this problem now before i leave you know we need to talk about x y and z um let me ask can i ask you this question can i ask you that question and so i think the mindset always begins with this idea of the selling stigma really and and we see this across all professions it doesn't matter i've seen it with lawyers fundraisers um people and selling everything that you can imagine every product and service you can imagine and there's this belief that um selling is doing something to somebody not for them and a belief that you as the salesperson are um you know maybe wasting someone's time um and that you're going that you're going to be manipulative and that you're going to be pushy and all of these stigmas you know create this mindset where as you said how do you how do you make that chasm and if you see yourself as a consultant and that your obligation while you're in someone's home and you have the opportunity is to bring bring things up as and it's not random because obviously it's in the same grouping of services that you cover um you just got to see yourself as that consultant and then have the courage to say in that moment, hey, while I'm here, and I, you know, I don't know your guys' business, so I'm not trying to wordsmith and give exact scripting. That would be um, inappropriate and not, not right for me to do. But it's just having that courage in, that, in the moment to bring these things up. And I think that's the key. Even if you do it badly, you know, most of go for no, a, a big chunk of it is not having the perfect it's not being perfect it's not it's not being able to say things and in the perfect way so that you've got the perfect script and everybody says yes to you which is kind of I think what a lot of sales training is rooted in go for no is about just making sure that we make the offer even if it's done poorly (laughs) and so I guess for your listeners I just want people to know that you know, you'll, you're better off, even if your transition feels awkward, even if you don't have the perfect words, to just be as honest as you possibly can, as straightforward and say, hey, like, while I'm here, you know, I would just want to bring up a couple things, maybe that I'm seeing with other customers. Um, and so I'm a big fan, too, of just of, of calling out the elephant in the room, which is something feels awkward, say it's awkward. <laughs> if something feels like, hey, this may see it seem out of left field hey, say that. This may seem out of left field, but I want to share this while I'm there. And underlying all of it is always the mindset that I'm trying to help these people. I'm not trying to harm them. Right. And I'm going to tell you this. This is, this is the, the best transition um, I've ever learned from anybody in any place I've ever worked. Um, and it wasn't the clothing business. I spent so many years there. So I probably have more stories there than anywhere else. Um, and this was the number one seller of socks and underwear for Macy's out of their thousand stores. This was the number one person selling socks and underwear. And 
it, it's like, it's like you know, in year after year, he's number one. And so the question is like, how did he do it? And the answer is every time he sold a, a you know, shirt, suit, ties, you know, whatever, he would then say, you ready for this? He'd say, oh, we almost forgot socks and underwear. And he would turn and he would walk towards the socks and underwear. What do you think every single customer would do? They'd just follow him. Follow him, right. What, what, he, what he didn't do was he didn't ask, hey, are you interested in socks and underwear? Because if you say, hey, are you interested in socks and underwear? 19 out of 20 people will say no. But if you say, ooh, I almost forgot to show you socks and underwear, they will follow you there. Now, how does that fit with what you're, with what you're doing? Well, I think the key thing is we're, we're always looking for what's this question I'm going to ask that's going to get me the permission to show the next item. And the point I'm making here is don't ask for permission to show the next item. Be excited about the next item. Just transition to the next item. Don't make it a question. Make it a statement. Great. Now that we've got this handled, let me show you this. And then just do it. If they don't want to go along physically or you know mentally for that ride, they'll say, no, 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 no. And see, in that moment, you've gone for no. And you've gone for no by not asking for no. You've gone for no by going for yes. And the customer will throw the no in when they don't want to. Um, and by the way, just just to show you how great this salesperson was, when customers would say, no, 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 I'm not interested in socks and underwear. He would turn and look back and he goes, oh, yeah, I know. No one's ever interested. Let me just show you for next time. And he would keep walking. And so there was an assumption on his on his part. And his assumption was, do people have socks and underwear in their drawer at home? Yeah. Why do they have them? Because they buy them, because they need them, because they like them. So, you know, it's the salesperson's responsibility to say, I've got something that you should be buying and that you will like and that you will need. And it's my job to show it to you. Now, it's your right to say no to it, but it's my job to at least expose you to it. So, Richard, I, I'm, I'm digging what you're putting down there. That's great. Um, my question in rattling around in my head is whose decision is it as to whether I need it or not? So, I mean, socks and underwear, I think that's kind of a given, right? Although there may be a few, uh, few in the listening audience that would put up a fight against that one. Uh, but I think most people would agree that those would be necessities. Um, some would argue that the products that we have to offer in the home services industry may not qualify for that. So, but that's all in terms of perspective or subjective, depending on who you're talking to. So whose decision is it as to whether it's something that the client needs? Is it theirs or is it yours? Oh, um, well, you know, that is a really good question. And I think ultimately uh, you may believe that the client needs it, but they're, they're going to decide now whether they're correct in their decision or not. That's a whole other story. <laughs> Um, you know, when, when I worked at Lens Crafters, I remember uh, always knowing the list of things people needed, but it was out of my control. Ultimately, um, they were going to choose what they were willing to spend and what they were willing to take. But again, it goes back to our obligation as salespeople is, hey, I really, really recommend this. Here's why. But ultimately, it's, it's in their lap and they, they can decide. But from a go for no perspective, it just always comes down to, uh, you know, making sure that we don't say no for the customer for whatever our reason. Sometimes we don't believe they have the money. Sometimes we believe they don't have the power to make the decision. So we just think, ah, this, this person, um, you know, the, the husband's not home or the wife's not home. So I, I'm not even going to bring this up because I'm just going to get a no and they're just going to. Uh, you know, they're just going to put me off. Whatever is going on in our own heads, whatever assumptions we come up with, most of those assumptions are designed just so we don't have to ask. Yeah, absolutely. So you you don't hear, <clears throat> sorry, you don't hear, um, you, you won't hear Matt Stafford and Joe Burrows come on mm -hmm. right, right before they cut to commercial and ask you if you mind if we cut to commercial. If you don't mind, we're going to play a Coca-Cola commercial next with some polar bears in it. Um, they don't, they don't ask if you want to hear it. They just play the commercial. And if you like what you see, 
if the Coca-Cola commercial makes you thirsty, they don't sponsor us, by the way. Um, and you, you'll go out and get a soda. Like, that's just all there is to it. Um, but nobody's asking your permission to present it. And far too often we feel like we don't have permission to present the products we have. And back to that point made earlier, we don't have, we don't have um, glass walls on our trucks where the client can see from their front window Thank what, goodness. What, <laughs> what we offer on our HVAC electrical plumbing trucks. Uh, if we don't bring the product up, chances are they don't know it exists. They don't know we have it. So presenting something doesn't mean necessarily you're saying, I know you absolutely need this. It's just saying, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Homeowner, this product exists. Let me know if you would like one. So you guys will find this fascinating. Richard and I just bought a, a new house and we're getting to know it a bit over the last two months. Congratulations. Thank you. And I have to tell you, I the, the few people that we've had over here in, in a few different capacities, electrician, um, we need someone, we need an HVAC person. Uh, I know a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, we need someone. I have to tell you, I feel, you know, for us, we actually um, want to spend as much money as we need because we want our house in as best. Possible. I know. I know three guys. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm begging people. I'm like, I remember even begging the guy with the homeowners insurance. I'm like, what else do I need? Like, tell me what else. Okay, that we got the basic policy. Like, what what am I missing? What other things do we need? I'm begging these people half the time and this programming that, and the mindset, which is really, you know, go for no, we often say is, um, or I guess I do is, is a principle. It's a strategy, meaning you can actually apply go for no and, and, and literally intentionally hear no more often. But the mindset that underlies it is very deep because we all are, it is in our DNA to not get rejected. It is built in as humans, don't be rejected, don't get thrown out of the tribe. So there's a lot of programming that goes on, which is why this is such a practice that people have to do. They've got to work at this stuff. And every time you are with a customer and you're in their house, you know, you just practice doing a little bit more and a little bit better each day. Not something that all of a sudden tomorrow, you're just going to be this like whirlwind Tasmanian devil salesperson zipping around somebody's house and getting, you know, 40 no's and 12 yeses. You just practice in those moments, in those, we call them go for no moments, where you have the opportunity to bring this stuff up and you practice it. Right. And not making assumptions on the customer's behalf, which means prejudging them, prejudging their desire to have what it is that you, that you have to offer or their ability perhaps to afford to buy you know, what it is that you have to offer. I want to tell you a story. And this one, I mean, if this one doesn't hit home um, and make people change their, the change, yeah. change their minds about things. When Andrew and I were at Lens Crafters, we had a, a product that um, we could offer to customers. We had regular plastic glasses. And there was also a thing called polycarbonate. Polycarbonate lenses um, are the things they make the, um, the canopy from fighter jets out of. It's the most, most shock resistant, shatter resistant, plastic right known known to man well we had a policy and the policy was you always show the polycarbonate to customers well i get this letter from this customer and she's in the letter she tells and it me it was a lot more expensive yeah it was like yeah, it was like hundred dollars more to get the polycarbonate lenses and i get this letter from this customer in the letter she tells the story and the story is she came into our to lens crafters she bought a pair of glasses for herself she bought a pair of glasses for um her child Two weeks later, she goes to the to her ophthalmologist for something else, and he says, "Let me see your kid's glasses." He looks at him and goes, "I can't believe these are just plastic. Where'd you get these?" He says, "I got them at Lens Crafters." He says, "Oh my God, I can't believe the salesperson didn't offer you polycarbonate. Ooh. You know, you can't have your your child's eyes, you know, um, subject to somebody, you know, throwing a rock or something. I mean, I can't believe you." So she goes back into the store. And she goes to the salesperson and she says, I need to ask you, I was in two weeks ago, do you have something called polycarbonate? And the salesperson says, yeah, we do. And she says, why didn't you offer it to me? And the salesperson told the truth. She said, oh, you know, we just get busy. You know, we get busy and we, we assume sometimes people aren't interested. And so, you know, and so I, I didn't offer them to you. 
So now I'm holding this letter in my hand. And here's the final line of the letter. You ready? The final line of the letter says, how dare you decide for me which of your products and services you think I'm entitled to know about? How dare you? Yeah. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. Big ouch. And, you know, we just, we, we made a policy. You never, ever, 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 ever and not offer the best you have because the customer is entitled to know about it. And so a lot of times we just make decisions. Oh, I don't think they'll be interested. Oh, this house doesn't look like it's very expensive. They probably don't have money to spend. They told me when we started the conversation, you know, they only wanted blank and they didn't want to hear about something. So we just make all of these assumptions that we're going to decide for people what they're going to get to know about. That is not our job. Our job is to let them know what we have and it's the customer's decision to say yes or no. It can be insulting, absolutely. And I think it, it, it's, um, it's more jarring when you're on the, um, the side of things where that occurs. You know, when uh, you go to a restaurant or a clothing store and you know, you, you know the person doesn't offer you the top and you're kind of like, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I might not have bought it, but... Uh, <laughs> you know, it should be nice. Like, all right. And so I, I think it can be insulting. It can also be downright dangerous. I mean, I, I think of it in terms of medical professionals. You know, if they don't tell you or disclose to you concerns that they see in your body or in your physical, um, you know, your, your physical being, uh, mm. there could be legitimate concerns that you would actually want to take either a proactive stance on or, you know, maybe even a, a reactive stance on, and you don't know, you're not a doctor. And so if they don't bring those things to your attention, who's doing the disservice, right? Right. It's, it's the doctor a hundred percent. And so, I mean, what, what's their job and why is that such a hard mind shift for us to make from, well, of course I want my doctor to tell me that I should lose weight. Uh, of course I want my doctor to tell me that I need you know, to cut out uh, certain things in my diet. Of course, I want my doctor to tell me that uh, there's something that he sees that's concerning that we should probably get tested because, I mean, that's me, right? Like, those are my choices to make, not his. And when he chooses to not tell me about those things, he's put himself in my body and has taken over the decision-making part of my brain. And that's not fair, nor is it right. And we would all object to that. So why is it so hard for us to swing that mental hurdle around the other direction when we're in the home and we're standing in front of a client saying basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And the answer is because people um, tend to take no personally. They think that if you thought uh, that if they offer a product or service and the customer says no, or the customer in particular gets upset as I know, I would have told you if I'd wanted to know about this, right. They, they feel that somehow, that that is a reflection on them as an individual, that somehow they have done something wrong. They have done a bad job. They push too hard. They behave like salespeople. Mm. And we, we let this fear that we're going to be, you know, that we're, we're going to be stigmatized, that we're going to be um, branded as manipulators. We let that get in the way of us doing our job. And so the point is, you got to go in and do your job. And a lot of salespeople are like, well, I do what you're saying. I'm going to get a lot more people saying no to me. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And you know what else you're going to get? A lot more people saying yes to you. And they're going to say yes to you on a lot higher price and better options. And so this is the job. You know, um, uh, we have a good friend. His name is Joel Weldon. Joel, Joel says, you know, salespeople don't get paid for the yeses. Yes, it's the easy part. They get paid to hear the word no. Mm. Get paid to hear the word no. If you just hear the word yes, and that's all you ever hear, then you are an order taker. That is what you are. You are an order taker. If you're a salesperson, then you are going to hear the word no a lot. Oh, that's that's good, man. I, I, that's the intro clip right there for the episode, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first time we've ever talked about what the intro clip for the episode was going to be. But yeah. yes, I agree. Good quote. <laughs> so uh, in the book, I believe the main character's name is Eric, correct? Right. All right. So in the book, Eric, of course, meets the the 10 year version of himself later. What what is it that, you know, if we had that same opportunity, if we were granted the same benefit of meeting our 10 year older self, 
What is it that changes Eric's mind? And, and not to be confusing, the, the younger Eric or the, the current version Eric. Like, what is it that changes the mind to actually say, okay, I'm going to start going for no? Wow. Well, you asked probably the best question that's ever been asked of us. I would, um, I would agree. Yeah, ever, ever. <laughs> Nate just I did the mic drop on. thing. Just FYI. <laughs> I know you guys can't see it. Well, you know, so we have to analyze our own work here. I think that's kind of why we take them on, a, take young Eric on this journey, right? And so together they end up, uh, they go to dinner and um, the older him explains the failure success model on the menu and how nobody wants to fail. They then go and fly up to um, the golf course and meet with the other people. And so he gets to hear from other people like how go for no works in their lives and how it's impacted their business. So we kind of, um, and Richard, my husband is very uh, logical and methodical. So in his mind, it was kind of like we were building a case like we start off with this premise and now we need to build all the, the evidence. So by the end, I think we have Eric convinced that this is what he needs to do. And also, and this is kind of um, the supernatural part of it. He also recognizes at the very end when his older version is about ready to go on stage and give a speech, that if he doesn't do this, that version of him that he has now met and knows Will, is not going to survive. Will literally not that's come, to, not exist. Will not come to fruition if he doesn't do this because he's been given this glimpse. Right, and you know, there's a there's a famous quote, and I think I'm uh, uh, I know, summarizing. I think I know what you're going to say. And when I texted this book to our leadership team, I said they missed the opportunity to use this quote. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not sure we're talking about the is, same. Is quote, it the definition gonna... of hell? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> no, we'll get back different. to that one. You go ahead. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, it's, a, it's a different quote. Um, uh, Winston Churchill said, some people stumble over the truth, pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and continue on their way as if nothing happened. And, wow. you know, that, that to us is the thing here. For everybody listening to this podcast right now, you've been inter introduced to an idea. A bell has been rung, okay? We've said, listen, you're not asking for no often enough. Um, and if you will change this one behavior, your life and the life of everyone around you, meaning your boss, your company, your family, and the customer, all of these lives are going to be better if you take this concept to heart. But if you just dust yourself off and continue on your merry way, as if nothing just happened, well, then, you know, this was maybe hopefully an hour of entertainment, but it isn't an hour of changing your life. So, you know, the, the question is, can we make people change? No. Um, can we hope that if they're ready to change and open to change, and if they hear this message and they say, wow, this really is profound, maybe instead of just dissing it or moving on to the next, you know, the next idea, Maybe I actually um, embrace this concept and apply it. And so that's the best I can offer you is that it's going to be individual on, you know, each, each person's basis. And sometimes when we speak at companies, you know, the, the, the president will say, can you guarantee that my, all of my people will change? And we say, no, I can guarantee <laughs> that about 10% of them will change. Right. Okay. And yeah, if I... you bring us back again and again and again, maybe we'll get 25%, but we're never going to get them all. So it is really a very personal thing. Yeah, you gave three options of what someone can do with the information in this book, which was uh, take it to heart, use it, change your life, uh, ignore it and, and stumble over the truth and dust yourself off and move on or diss it. I don't believe there is that third option in this, in, in this case because it's either do something with it and let it change your life or just ignore it and go on about your, your uh, mundane day. But there's no, I, I mean, I implore anyone to, contact us and like throw a rock at this concept there's no rock to throw you can either you can either move with it and and utilize it and become more successful at like every aspect of your life or you can just ignore it but there's no holes to poke in this as far as i can see 
and then we can move on to the to the quote that I was referring to with yeah. our leadership team. Yeah, I'm curious about that, Brian. So when they print their fifth and sixth editions of this book, and of course they'll use you <laughs> as a foreword, uh, what, what would that quote be, Brian? So the quote that I texted our leadership team when I texted them, texted them a link to this book was, um, and it is anonymous, but it says a wise man once said, the definition of hell is when the person you are meets the person you could have been. Mm. 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 Oh, that's good. Yeah. Well, our, our young Eric is in hell when he meets the older version of himself. Absolutely. Um, like it's a, yeah. especially if you're older, Eric, thinking about going back to being younger, Eric, that's the real definition of hell. Right. Like I didn't just get a glimpse of what I could have been. I spent 10 years being um, the, the very successful version of myself. And mo- it seemed like every aspect of life, certainly. Um, or, and then now I, I'm faced with going back and, and just being 10 years older. Um, as David Sandler said, I didn't have 10 years of experience. I had one year of experience. I repeated nine times. That's, <laughs> that's the real definition of hell is like moving that far backwards and just being 10 years older. You're right. So Brian. Now you, oh, go ahead, Andrea. You guys, you guys need to help me convince Richard because we've been talking about the sequel to go for no, which is, um, Eric has a daughter who's now, I don't know, 20, 20, yeah, college age, 20 something. And so this is, we need a, the next story of, of how she learns to go for no, but I can't get him to write it. So maybe you guys can talk him into it. Mm. Come on, buddy. I want to read it. Uh, You can take 17 (laughs) hours out of your busy schedule for the sequel. Come on. Days, 17 days. Oh, I'm sorry. Days, right. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes, I, I, I could. I haven't completely wrapped my brain around the, the story yet, but, um, yeah. What, what, I, what was the process just so we could get an idea of what, what it would look like for, let's say you're going to put 20 days into this one, three whole weeks, 21 days. What would, uh, what does the process look like, uh, where you came, um, where you, where you, uh, pen this first well, I, book? I think in the spirit of things, he would just start writing until he gets the yes and then continue writing. I mean, <laughs> it, it, when that work? I mean, do you, do you get secluded? Did, when you, what was day one like when you said, all right, I'm going to write this book? What did it look like? I just, I've never written anything. I don't think Nate has yet, although I'm sure he's going to. <laughs> I'm not going to read it personally. But, <laughs> but if well, you don't mind sharing. I, yeah, no, well, well, first off, I'll give you the picture. You got a picture. Andrea and I had very nice, um, well paid middle management jobs with health insurance and a free car and 401k and, houses and all that kind of stuff and we gave it all up to be able to start our business so now we are in a small little apartment um in oceanside Oceanside, california near the army base that's a nice town awesome yeah yeah we don't even want to spend money though on a desk so i have two old file cabinets and on top of the two file cabinets is a door and i'm using the door as the top of my desk so first off you have to get the picture that I'm writing this book in a in a in an in an environment where I almost have to picture the future um, at the same time. I've got to say, writing this book is going to change this change the environment that I'm sitting in. Um, and so, uh, so that's the first part of it. And then the second part of it is um, uh, just just outlining it, just just saying. You know, what's the, what, what's the first, what's the first thing we have to explain? And then, you know, what's the advanced stuff? And then what's the nuance? And, you know, so it's just, it really was a matter of just kind of plotting it out. I probably plotted it out for three or four days and then just started writing like a, like a mad fool. Um, and then I'll tell you the final thing though, is that the magic doesn't happen in the writing. The magic always happens in the editing. And that is where Andrea comes in mm. because she, she can take six whole pages of stuff that I've, I've written, and instead of doing, you know, spelling, uh, you know, fixing some spelling here and there, she'll just take a big red marker, X them all <laughs> out, and that hurts more than anything else uh-huh. in the world. Yep. You know, it takes it takes you know an hour or two per page to get a, a really good page that you think you've well crafted, and then to watch somebody um, destroy, you know, twelve hours of work in about forty five <laughs> seconds. Perfect. A little, I think is the word you meant. Heart- Right. (laughs) But in the end, but in the end, that's what, that's what makes, um, that's what puts quality into something. You know, if you only put what you only put the best stuff in 
and everything else that's marginal has to get X'd out. Um, that's also a philosophy for life for us. Yeah, you're right about that. I mean, our philosophy here is waste no day. And I have to go back to what you were saying there, Brian. Um, there's plenty of songs, books, memoirs, uh, poems, et cetera, that are written from the end of life looking back. Uh, because that's, that's really, in, as in human terms, that's really all we can do. We live on a linear line of time. There's no going back. All we can do is, you know, reflect on the past. We can't actually jump back into it. And so I think that's what makes the book and the concept interesting. Um, even though you know, it's not necessarily realistic, it is realistic in terms of coming to an idea or, or a, a connection point as to what am I willing to allow myself to become. Like if I continue on this trajectory, where do I think it will lead? We've, we've done entire podcasts of, uh, of some of our tradespeople who they had to make those types of decisions where they had to make a decision. If I continue, I'm going to end up dead. Like I'm, I'm going to end up in drugs. I'm going to end up in jail. I'm going to end up in a place that's not where I want to be. And they had to make life altering decisions. This, while it may not lead to a course of death, if you continue on what you're doing, it, it may lead to a, a mental death or a, a financial death, or at least not a financial or mental realization of what you want to become. A stagnation that, that yeah. to me feels much worse than death. Right. And, and that the ability to, to not recognize that hell, to not see what you could have became and decided not to do it anyways, is I think what we're prompting or we're asking, dare I say, begging people to do on this podcast, like recognize where you are right now, come up with a plan where you want to be and let nothing hold you back from accomplishing that. That's really what Eric had the rare and dare I say near impossible opportunity of doing in this book. But this podcast, this book serves as that, that, the cornerstone, that touchstone, that, that point in the sand that you draw the line and say, here's where I changed. And the great thing about the book and, and the re one big huge reason that I just beg our audience to get the book um, and probably read it, although anyone who's listened to this show long, long enough knows that I'm not a, a reader, at least with my eyes. Um, I was driving, had perfect silence, just a long freeway trip and listened to it the first time. And that was great because I could you know how you get on cruise control mentally when you're, when you're on just a straight freeway drive for an hour. Um, but I was able to kind of disconnect and really um, immerse myself in Eric's world and just kind of walk through, you know, the bedroom with him where he's like kind of they're running up to the library that he didn't know existed and looking for his own books in this, you know, future version of himself. Um, and you, you get to feel what he felt, and, and at the end of the book, and you get to kind of conceptualize your own 10 year from now self and go, who do I want to be then? And what decisions am I making right now to decide that? And it's way more than just the go for no. It has, it has so much more value to it than just going for no and getting more yeses. It's like he, he, he got to see a 10 year future version of himself and realize in a very, very realistic sense that the decisions he makes right now are going to decide who he is then. It was really cool to, to listen to with a 13-year-old boy. Right. Well, that, that's what makes it provocative, right? Because I mean, it draws his thoughts out. Yeah, big time. I mean, it was, I can't believe that book was an hour and a half. I still cannot. Three times I've listened to it, and I feel like I'm spending like seven or nine hours on it each time. Like, <laughs> There's so much in that little book, and I'm I don't gush too hard on our guests too often. Um, man, I, I just can't get over how much meat was in that uh, little portion. It's just uh, phenomenal to me, and I would love for every person who listens to this episode to to read or listen to that book. Um, and by all means, let us know the feedback you have, and we're happy to pass any feedback on to the authors. Amazing summary. Yeah, and we appreciate your taking the time with us today. And we're going to bring it in for a landing here, Richard and Andrea. And I just want to have a, a few ending questions for us. But uh, one of those is, you know, as you speak into the lives of people, um, as you're doing your consulting and training and those types of things, what is it that you're finding to be the most effective first step? 
So um, normally what we suggest, and I think this is pretty effective and we hear from people uh, about this as well, is just create a no awareness. So, you know, take a couple weeks and just analyze where you are now. And I think that is a helpful first step to see, do you hear no a lot? Are, are you like a, a no getter now? Or a no getter? You... Did you just make that up? That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, we uh, we have a, a online course and we call everybody in the course no getters. Um, that, that's the name. <laughs> that's, of, awesome. that's the name everyone came up with. I, I wish I could take credit for that. So, you know, where are you now? And um, do you are you executing on those go for no moments when you have that opportunity, or do you, you know, talk yourself out of it like we talked about on this podcast? So that's step number one is really just creating that no awareness. Yeah, and I guess in 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 my case, um, I'll come at it a little bit of a little bit of a different angle, but I have a a saying up on my wall. I did not write this, um, but it really is. Uh, I think it's, I think it's super, um, super impactful. And, um, you know, the saying is success is hard, broke is hard, if you're hard, you know, um, it's, it's hard to do the things that you have to do to be successful. Uh, but man, being broke is hard too. And not living your dreams is hard. Having to look at those around you who you love and care for most not get the life that they deserve because you decided not to overcome some of your fears and limitations. That's hard. So like, you know, pick your heart. Uh, every day I say, okay, which heart are you going to pick today? Um, it's going to be hard to be out of shape in 10 years. Um, maybe the better heart is just to get on the treadmill, mm. you know, just yeah. pick the, pick the right heart. And so go for no, um, it's harder in the beginning than just, letting people tell you what they want and you know, ending it there. But it's going to be hard if you don't do it too. So um, pick your heart. I love it. Those are good words to end on. Our guests today have been Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz. If our listeners are interested in learning more about you, uh, about the book, Go For No, or any of the resources that you have, where's the best place to find those? They should go to gofornode.com. We've got a 20 question assessment there, which is kind of fun to take. So you can see where your current thoughts and attitudes are around failure, rejection, hearing or no. I'm on Twitter at goforno, Instagram at goforno. So you can't not find us if you type in goforno on Google. <laughs> yeah, cool. and I'll be down all um, painting or watching YouTube videos. So, um, yeah, or writing. So contact oh, Andrea. Uh, hey. and <laughs> Tommy Mello said to tell you guys it was uh, an absolute pleasure working with you, and he is huge fans of your work and what you do. And, I mean, we only know about you because he recommended your book on an episode, and um, we are also huge fans of what you guys do. So please, please, we want to hear about the uh, 20-year-old daughter of Eric. So uh, get to it. We expect it in about three weeks. Nice. <laughs> Hey, just okay. one final question for you guys as we wrap things up, just for fun. Uh, you did mention that you are married, and uh, I'm just a little curious about the go for no story that got to that outcome. Oh yeah. Oh, are you? Do you know this story, or are you just are you fishing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> fishing. <laughs> um, I asked Andrea to marry me every day for over a year. I'm, I'm not exaggerating oh, here. Oh my uh, word over 400 times in all. And every time I asked her, she said, no. no, of course. And then one day we were walking through a department store and um, I, you know, I did kind of a throwaway proposal. I said, are you going to marry me or what? And she said, yes. And I was so used to her saying no, that it didn't even register at first. And then I realized, oh my God, the woman of my dreams has just said yes. And I haven't bought the ring yet. So um, <laughs> I ran department bought the ring i caught up with her uh in the shoe department where she was sitting in a chair trying on shoes and i, I knelt down in front of her with the ring did the did the proposal the formal proposal and uh it, it was all very romantic that's right very yep. nice very nice good good well thank you so much for taking time out of your days to share with us uh on this podcast as well as with your book and like brian said hopefully there's more to come we really appreciate it Thanks, you guys. Okay, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. It was good to meet both of you.
you as well. Um, and let us know when it comes out, please. Wow. Uh, I don't end too many podcasts without having a lot left to say, but man, I thought that was a really, really solid episode from start to finish. And just the, the general concepts of pursuing something better align so well with our entire motto here, Waste No Day, um, making those decisions now. And the book is something, it's an easy read or an easy listen that you can go through. Um, and maybe it's, li- maybe it's life-changing for you. And if it's not this book, maybe it'll be in another episode. But what we want to be doing is constantly putting information in front of you, materials, guests, concepts, ideas, whatever it is that are going to improve you and make a difference in your life. We are not about standing still. We are not about stagnation. We are not about accepting the status quo. We are about pushing forward. If you're that type of person, there's more for you in store. As always, we challenge you, no matter what the day is, to wake up each morning and choose to waste no day.